Well, good morning. God's peace to you. It's wonderful to be here in this place and pray that you're blessed for being here this morning. We have wrapped up the Exodus series and then uh, Pastor Lee spoke to you last week. So I hope you enjoyed that uh, variety. Uh, it's great to have Lee here who can fill in preaching so well. And uh, I came back and the building's still standing and all of you are here. So uh, it's good to know that we've got uh, a strong, stable church that can uh, continue, certainly without me, no problem. <laughs> so um, we're going to start our little short series before uh, the fall on restoration principles. Now that may sound uh, odd or unfamiliar to you, um, as you may or may not know. The church here, the Amity Christian Church, is part of, historically at least, what's called the Restoration Movement. And uh, this is an American uh, church tradition that developed in the early 1800s. And so we're going to talk about kind of the principles that guided the church uh, coming out of this period of time um, and, and formed this particular uh, tradition. We, we hesitate to use terms like denomination in our tradition, and you'll see soon why that is. Uh, we prefer movement. Um, but a lot of this is going to be maybe uh, interesting and help you understand a little about, about the character of the church. But I hope more than that, it will give you a sense of what um, we've been able to draw from that here locally. That's a real part of our DNA or our culture as a church, as a community, um, and how we operate. So uh, we're going to do a little bit of history today, so bear with me on that. Uh, the rest of the series, about four or five sermons, we're going to be focusing more on those principles. So to begin with, um, I think you have to acknowledge the fact that in the early 1800s in the United States, um, you have a brand new situation. Uh, anybody remember what happened just before the 1800s? It might have been pretty significant. Something called the American Revolution, right? 1776, the Declaration of Independence was signed, and there was a war, a revolutionary war, and the United States Constitution was there for ratified after that. And and this is all in the background of what's going on in the religious landscape of the United States at that time. There was a huge um, spirit of independence just flowing through the nation. And so a lot of Christian people who were part of the old world denominations, right? The old world churches, those state churches, right? The, uh, the churches that came over from England, like the Church of England that was here referred to as the Episcopal Church, or the Church of Scotland, or the Presbyterian Church, or perhaps even the, the Lutheran Church, or certainly at that time there would have been a ton of Lutherans, but certainly there would have been English Baptists and Quakers and a lot of the English uh, Reformed uh, churches. And a lot of Christians in the United States were like, you know what? We're Americans now. We don't need that old world religion. We don't need that old world system of church. And what they found themselves in was a new world where there were all these different churches, not really homogenous like it was in the old world. If you were in England, you went to the Church of England, or you were a dissenter and a sectarian, and you went to one of those English Baptist or Quaker churches, right? Um, or you went to, um, if you were, certainly if you were in Germany, you went to the Lutheran Church, or if you were in Scotland, you went to the Church of Scotland. The Presbyterian Church was kind of unique in that it, it was kind of a state church, but not really. Um, and all those traditions had followed the uh, settlers who had come from that part of the world. And they look around, they see around them Methodists. Who are Methodists? Where do they come from? Well, they're Church of England derivatives, essentially. Um, but they're not exactly Episcopalian, right? The Methodists were following a particular brand of Anglicanism called, uh, after John Wesley. So you have that really flourishing in the United States um, under Thomas Coke and Francis Asbury and, and leaders like that. And then you have the English Baptists, uh, Roger Smith and all these uh, preachers and, and, and uh, revivalists that were uh, 
horseback riding across the countryside. You had um, the, the Reformed churches like the Presbyterian church. And, and you have this um, amalgamation of, of different kinds of churches. And back then, it was not like it is today. Back then, if you went to the Presbyterian church, you did not go to the Baptist church. In fact, you might not even have dinner with those filthy Baptists. If you went to the Episcopalian church, you wouldn't dare step foot in that Presbyterian church. You had a real divisive spirit within the denominational landscape. And a lot of Americans are like, hey, we're independent. We won this revolution. Let's do it a new way. And so the spirit of independence spawned many, many, many new church traditions in the United States in the early 1800s. If you find a church that has a heritage that's longer than last week, which is sometimes hard to do these days, but if you find a church like that, they probably started in the 1800s, somewhere before the Civil War. A lot of the churches began in America around that time, at least the different strains of, of uh, denominations or, or brands of Christianity, if you will. And uh, when they looked, let's go back to that first slide. Well, I'm not quite there yet, Freddie. Um, when you looked across the landscape, you'd see all these churches and you would wonder, why is there so many, why are there so many churches? Why, why can we as a country be united, but we can on Sunday morning be united. And so a lot of Americans had not only this, this spirit of independence, but they also had this spirit of unity. And they realized that the divided church landscape in front of them was not really what they wanted to see. All right, let's, let's go ahead and go to that next slide. Thanks, Freddie. Yeah, so they're seeing this church division, and now we'll look at the history of the church in, in general. And that might be hard to see uh, from where you're sitting, but if you go all the way back to the beginning, start with Jesus and the apostles, and then the early Christian church uh, carries on fairly united. Um, there's certainly folks who branch off of the church, but they are uh, going in a completely different direction. They're considered heretics, and they're not part of the church. So that, that unity of the church pretty consistently follows um, from the time of the apostles until the Great Schism in 1054. Great Schism is the term historians use to refer to the split between the East and the West. Now, you may be aware, I was in the airport one time, and um, this guy standing in front of me was in a, a black um, cassock or robe, and he had uh, a hat on, looked kind of uh, Egyptian or Arabic looking hat, um, kind of rounded with a, a kind of a hem along it. And, um, but then he had a cross on. And I wasn't sure because it looked Arabic. And then, you know, I said, you know, it's obviously not a Muslim because he's got a cross. So I asked him, I said, what, what church do you represent? And he said, I'm from the Coptic Christian Church. Have you ever heard of the Coptic Christian Church? That's uh, the Egyptian branch of the Eastern Orthodox Church. They're a little different even from most Eastern Orthodox churches. So when you look at Eastern Orthodox, you've got the Greek Orthodox Church. Anybody seen that movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, right? They all went to the Greek Orthodox Church, right? Um, and a lot of people who go to the Greek Orthodox Church are Greek first and Christian second, as, as uh, Eric Metaxas says, uh, speaking from his history in the, in the Greek church. Um, it's a big culture. Um, and Eastern Orthodoxy is huge in different parts of the world. Certainly the Russian Orthodox Church is well uh, represented throughout the world outside of Russia as well. So you have this Eastern Orthodoxy that begins and you have the split from the the West and the East. And largely this is political, right? You have Constantinople, the Bishop of Constantinople, and you've got the Bishop of Rome. And by 600 AD, the Bishop of Rome had kind of started to claim um, supremacy over the churches, claiming that uh, the Bishop of Rome had uh, authority to direct not just the churches in his district, but all over the world. And so there's a split from east to west. And then in the 16th century, you're very familiar, I'm sure, with the, the Protestant Reformation, right? 
uh, Martin Luther nails his 99 theses on the Wittenberg uh, door there and sets off the Protestant Reform uh, Reformation. And from that, you have Protestantism, which is then uh, results in a variety of different directions or traditions of the faith. You have Lutheranism, obviously following Martin Luther, but you also have uh, the English reformers, uh, or what we refer to as Anglicanism, and that includes the Episcopalian, Baptist, Methodist, and then at some point in the 20th century, the Pentecostal church uh, is tied into Anglicanism a little bit. But that's primarily what you're seeing on the... Um, the American front in the early 1800s is the English Anglican tradition in its variety of forms, uh, mixed in with a little bit of Irish and Scottish Presbyterianism. And then, of course, the Calvinists, the Presbyterians in the Reformed churches, uh, they come out of this Protestant Reformation. Every church that exists today that's within the historic stream of Christianity is going to follow one of these branches back to Jesus and the apostles. So if you wonder, like, where do we fit in that stream? Uh, well, that's going to take us to the, uh, the Presbyterian branch, as we'll see, um, and then we'll flow out from there. Let's go to the next slide, which may be even more difficult to see. Yeah, I got a little carried away. Uh, yeah, I'll have to read that to you, I think. Um, so you see on the left, there's the regular Baptist tradition, right? That comes out of the English uh, Protestant Reformation. Then you have the Methodist, right? Comes out of that same Anglican tradition. Um, and then you have the Presbyterians. So where do we fit in that? Well, we kind of fit with all three of them, although more closely with the Presbyterians. Now, there was this group of... Uh, regular Baptists that were led by Abner Jones and Elias Smith in the New England states. And they had caught this idea of unity in the church. They wanted to see unity in the church. They wanted to get past the divisions of that were what they saw as man-made uh, divisions by what they call confessions of faith, essentially. So there would be a confession of faith that you would have to agree to, very often sign that your agreement to in order to be part of this particular church tradition or that particular church tradition. Um, the, uh, the regular Baptists had their confession of faith. The Presbyterians famously have their Westminster confession of faith. Um, the Methodists would have fallen back on the 39 articles of the Church of England. And Abner Jones and Elias Smith said, this is crazy. Let's drop that distinction based on man's words and just go back to the Bible. And in fact, this is kind of the American thing that's going on, right? They want to drop those old labels from the old world. And so they have this idea of being Christians only. Let's not be Baptist Christians or Methodist Christians or Presbyterian Christians or Lutheran Christians. Let's just be Christians only because we're Americans. We don't need all that old stuff, right? That was their, their attitude. And uh, they worked hard in the New England states, and they drew the attention of James O'Kelly, who was kind of coming out of the Methodist tradition, but had some of the same ideas. Now, that's what tells you it's cultural, because they're all having the same idea at the same time, but they're coming from different directions, right? Uh, they're all thinking, let's just be Christians only. We don't need these other modifiers. So James O'Kelly uh, is leading a group there in the New England states, Philadelphia and other places. And they, they develop later on what's called the Christian Connection. And I don't know why they spelled it with an X, but they did. Uh, the Christian Connection. And Barton W. Stone, who was a Kentucky Presbyterian, he was having the same ideas as these New Englanders. He was thinking, you know what? We don't need all these theological distinctions. We can just go by the Bible alone. And part of the reason they had this attitude is the same reason that the framers of the Constitution thought that we could write a document and we could all be governed by it. They were coming out of what was called Scottish rationalism, which is the idea that words are understandable, and you can use those words to communicate meaning. And if somebody has enough understanding to know the, what the words mean, they can understand them clearly, right? There was no hidden messages. Um, it was very rational. 
And out of that Scottish rationalism, represented probably most by John Locke, um, they were able to decide that you could just open the Bible. Anybody could open the Bible and they could understand it. And this also comes from the Protestant Reformation as well, right? Luther wanted everybody to have the Bible in their own language. Uh, you know, many people after him really pushed for that. Uh, William Tyndale famously uh, worked to get the, the Bible in the English language. So many folks uh, had this idea, if everybody could just read it for themselves, then we could all know what it says. You have this enlightenment rationalism through the, through the Presbyterian Scottish background, especially you get this idea that we don't need extra documents to tell us what it says. We can just go by what the Bible says. Well, that was a, a very idealistic way of thinking. And of course, after the American Revolution, they were high on their ideals and they thought we can do this. So let's just be Christians only. Let's unite around what the Bible says. And Barton W. Stone loved that. Famously, Barton W. Stone quibbled about the Trinity when he was ordained as a Presbyterian ministry, a minister, not because he didn't believe in the Trinity, but because the word wasn't in the Bible. He said, how can I confess to something that's not in the Bible? That's how these people thought, right? They were very um, uh, literalists when they came to the words of a text, right? Which is interesting when you think about how people interpret the Constitution today. <laughs> the way they looked at documents was, it says what it says, let's stick to that, don't add to it, don't take from it, just go with what the words say. And so when they asked him to agree with the Westminster Confession of Faith, he said, these are his words, I can agree to it so far as I see that it agrees with, it aligns with the Bible. <laughs> That's what he said. And uh, he was uncomfortable with it. And so when he heard about these New Englanders, he's like, hey, I like that idea. Let's just be Christians only. Let's not use these uh, confessions of faith written by men to divide us. Let's just go by the Bible. So for a short time, he was involved with the Christian connection. But he was way out in Kentucky. And in those days, that, that might have been on the other side of the world uh, as far as actually communicating with people was concerned. That was considered the frontier. And so when we talk about our our historical movement, it was out on the Western frontier. People in Oregon think, well, I know what the Western frontier is. It's like, no, Ohio, <laughs> Pennsylvania, Kentucky, that was the Western frontier in the early 1800s. And that's where Barton Stone is at. Stone also is involved in what's called the Second Great Awakening in 1801. You have this Cane Ridge revival and there's there's people from all different church groups. There's Baptists and Methodists and Quakers. There were even some Shakers. Uh, they were all there. And Barton Stone, he's a Presbyterian Scottish rationalist, and he sees these people, and they're doing some pretty weird things. He takes notes as he walks around the grounds at the Cane Ridge Meeting House. Basically, people just would stand on a stump and preach, or they'd they stand on the back of a wagon and preach, and that people would gather around them. And this was going on all throughout the woods around the Cane Ridge Meeting House, uh, where uh, Shannon and our family lived for many years in West Virginia, in Huntington, West Virginia. It's about a two-hour two hour drive from the location of the Cane Ridge Meeting House, and you can go there today. It's preserved. It's a, it's a cabin, kind of logwood cabin building, and they have built around it uh, another building to keep it safe from the elements. So you go inside one building to see another building. And it's pretty amazing. It, it, they have an upper, um, an upper balcony where the slaves would meet with them. They could be on the upper balcony. Um, they had, uh, it was, you think your chairs are uncomfortable. Uh, they had pews that were made from logs that had been cut in half. And that's where you sat, not for 30, 45 minutes, but for hours. Sometimes they would preach two, three hours while you're sitting on that log. But this Cane Ridge Revival Meeting is, is, kicks off what's called the Second Great Awakening. It's a very significant event historically in America. Uh, but Barton Stone's right in the middle of it, and he is looking at what's going on. And people are responding to the preachers, these revivalistic uh, messages. They're responding... Um, in bizarre ways. Some of them are laughing. Some of them are um, seem to 
lose control of their bodies and start shaking. Some of them were even barking like dogs. And so he took notes of this. And his notes were, hmm, this is interesting. Not sure what's going on here. Um, but he was very uh, uh, positive and wanted to be optimistic about people hearing the gospel. So he wasn't super critical of it. He was open to seeing what God might be doing. Well, like the, the first Great Awakening, the second Great Awakening was kind of like a big moment, revival, and then it died away. And Stone is left there uh, in Kentucky, and he has issues with the Presbyterian Church. And eventually him and some other Presbyterians decide to leave the Presbyterian Church. But they're not ready to just completely drop that connection. So uh, they, they develop what they call the, the Springfield Presbytery, right? And this is all happening within the space of a few years. In 1804, those folks who established what they called the Springfield Presbytery decided, nope, we don't want it anymore. So they published, because back then uh, they didn't have um, the internet, they didn't have uh, billboards. And what they did is they sent out tracts or they sent out newsletters or religious journals, newspapers, things like that. And they published what they called in one of the uh, religious journals of that time, they called it the last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery, which starts something like, we will that this body die and sink into oblivion and that all of its members be absorbed essentially into Christian union with all other believers. This idea of unity, independence, and being Christians without labels, essentially, was very important to them. Well, after that, what are they going to do? Well, he finds that connection with those New England uh, uh, folks, and he, uh, for a short time, connects with them, the Christian connection. Uh, but then, after a while, he hears about what's going on in western Pennsylvania, with a couple Presbyterians who had left the Presbyterian church. Well, they really weren't left. They, they got kicked out. Uh, Thomas Campbell had come over before his family, um, had immigrated over before his family, and he was a Presbyterian minister, and the Presbyterian church in uh, uh, Philadelphia sent him to Western Pennsylvania, and he was there for one whole year. And during that time, he realized that all these churches around him, Baptists and Methodists and so on and so forth, they didn't always have a clergy person there to baptize them, to officiate at their weddings. Uh, and most importantly, they couldn't have communion because back then to have communion, you had to have uh, a minister, an ordained minister officiate the communion. And so Thomas Campbell, who's also kind of been on this uh, unity track, he sees this and he says, this is crazy. Let's invite them to our church where they can have communion with us. And the Presbyterian church hears about this back in Philadelphia and they're not happy. What are you doing? You're letting the Methodists and the Baptists have communion with the Presbyterians. Uh, and they kicked him out. So he and some other folks in Western Pennsylvania and, and Eastern Ohio, they develop what's called the the. Washington Christian Union of Ohio, Washington County, I think it was. And uh, within, within a few months, they decide, no, that's a mistake. We're just going to repeat the, the whole man-made religion thing again. Let's drop that aside. We're just going to be Christians only. Everybody's saying the same thing, thinking the same thing. It's kind of in the air, right? Well, Stone hears about Thomas and Alexander Campbell. Alexander is Thomas's son who two years after Thomas gets to the States, he arrives, he goes to see his father, sees what his father's doing, is very happy with it. And he really kind of takes on the mantle of leading the movement, which they like to use the term disciples more than Christians. Uh, Campbell would bicker that, you know, the disciples were called Christians by their enemies. So we, we weren't going to go with the disciples term. But eventually they come together and there's this historic meeting at the Cane Ridge Meeting uh, House there in uh, Eastern Kentucky. Uh, there's a picture in the stained glass around the, the building, around the original building. There's a stained glass picture depicting Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone shaking hands, um, 
memorializing when they finally met and brought their movements together. So essentially, from 1831, when Stone and Campbell got together in the merger of those two movements, all through the Civil War, uh, these group of churches, which generally are referred to as the American Restoration Movement churches, they became the largest Christian group in the country. There were more of them than any other group. Uh, they just blew up because they were riding on the spirit of the age, essentially. And it just blew up. People were leaving their old world denominational identities and they were joining the American Restoration Movement. And then, of course, the Civil War happens. And uh, like everything, the Civil War divided churches. That's why you have Southern Baptists and Northern Baptists. That's why you have uh, African Methodist Episcopal churches and the Episcopal church. That's why you have so many divisions that were happened right around the time of the American Restoration Movement. And the result of that was uh, two branches, essentially, that were officially recognized in 1906. The U.S. Census was taken in 1906, and they reached out to um, a editor of one of the religious journals called The Gospel Advocate in Nashville, Tennessee. They reached out to a man named David Lipscomb. And David Lipscomb, known for Lipscomb University, um, he told the census taker that essentially there were two movements, and what largely distinguished them is that the churches in the South, the churches of Christ, did not use instruments in their, their music, their worship music, where churches in the North did, because there were a bunch of carpetbaggers that had all that money after restoration uh, or re reconstruction. And so you have this uh, division largely around class, but also around how they read the Bible. A big difference between Christian churches and churches of Christ is Churches of Christ took that literal reading of the Bible almost to an extreme. They look at everything in the Bible like a constitution, a law book. And if you can't find it in the Bible, it is therefore wrong. They have no authority to do it. So, for example, um, an instrument. If you look at the New Testament, you can't find a church using instruments. Now, sometimes folks will say there's, there's no instrumental music in the New Testament. Well, that's not exactly true because the book of Revelation has them all over the place. But you don't see any churches actually using instrumental music. And they would say, well, therefore, we have no authority to use them today. Where the Christian church movement in the north, essentially, they didn't make that distinction. They said, if there's no teaching about it in the Bible, then it's a matter of opinion. Right? And we can have liberty in matters of opinion. But if it's something the Bible teaches, then we have to agree on it. Right? So... They're trying to work out how do we have unity, and out of that becomes this divisive way of reading the Bible, that you have to do it only in a certain way or not. Um, later on in 1968, uh, the Christian church movement is divided yet again when a group of churches uh, went through a process of restructure and formed a church that had a denominational structure. Now, what, what I mean when I say that is they have a headquarters and they have a president and they have a decision-making body that's above the local congregation, right? Um, up until 1968, from 1930, or 1831 to 1968, all American Restoration Movement churches were governed locally, right? The local elders decided what happened in the local church. But after 1968, a, a significant group of Christian churches uh, formed a denomination that's called the Christian Church, and very often it'll say, in parentheses after that name, it'll say Disciples of Christ. Now, I put liberal there because, well, that's the only way you could possibly describe them. Um, they weren't that way to start with, I don't think, um, but they certainly have ended up there. Also, the uh, movement that came out of the uh, regular Baptist and Methodist tradition, the Christian connection, that turned extremely liberal as well and resulted in many of them joining the Universalist Church or the United Church of Christ, which is, uh, ironically, the disciples in the United Church of Christ have formed a, a concordant agreement where they can uh, exchange ministers from either denomination because they're so liberal, it doesn't matter really anyways, I think. But, okay, so, have I lost you yet? 
No? All right, all right, here we go. Let's go to the next slide. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll get the next slide up here. Now, history of the Amity Christian Church. This might be more interesting to you. So we'll take Alexander Campbell, Barton Stone. They're kind of the Presbyterians who started this movement in the early 1800s. And Amos Harvey is a Quaker who lives in Kentucky. Right? He's raised in a Quaker family. And uh, as you know, a lot of Quakers moved out here to Oregon. Uh, George Fox University has an affiliation with the Quaker Church. A lot of Quakers moved to this part of the country at that time. And Amos Harvey was one of those. But before he came to, uh, to Oregon, uh, in Kentucky, he came across the writings of Alexander Campbell. And he quickly caught the spirit of the Christians only movement. And, uh, and then when they came out here in 1845, he brought that with him. Interestingly, the reason that um, Jerry Rushford, the president of Pepperdine University, wrote in his history of a Christian church here in Oregon, what he calls uh, Christians on the Pioneer Trail, uh, he says that the Amity Christian Church is the first church of this movement uh, to be established west of the Rockies. The reason he says that is because Amos Harvey wrote a letter to Alexander Campbell to report on how things were going. And that was published in Campbell's Religious Journal. So Amos Harvey tells him, we've got out here and uh, we're trying to make our way. And we found some other uh, believers and we formed a church. They, they uh, formed a church, him and his wife, in 1846, uh, which we call the Amity Christian Church. If you look at the, the bell uh, that was minted, I think, in 1881, that may not be right, um, quite a bit later, it has the name Amity Christian Church on it. And most of the documents, that's the name that was given. In the 50s, when that restructure happened with the disciples, um, it seems like the church changed its name to Church of Christ to distinguish from that disciples movement. And then, of course, we adopted the Christian church name not too long ago again. But when it started in 1846, there was Amos and Jane and 13 other charter members. And Glenn, this little guy over here on the left, Glenn O. Burnett, was the first preacher of the Amity Christian Church. And there have been many, many preachers on down through the years since 1846 um, that are a part of that tradition. The picture of the building there was the building uh, erected in 1892, um, which now is a parking lot next to the middle school and the district office. The district office was for a long time the parsonage where uh, Larry and Joan and his family lived when Larry Hake was the pastor here. So that's a history of this church. That's where we're connected. Now let's move to the next slide. Let's go ahead and hit the, see if that'll play. Maybe it won't. Oh. Yeah, so that's part of your history. Um, the old Bethel Cemetery out off of Zena Road. Um, and the, the old Bethel College, you know, it only was around for seven years, and then it went moved to Monmouth. And you go down to Western Oregon University, what's the main road that you drive through there? Campbell Way. <laughs> Some of those buildings are named uh, in accordance with the restoration movement. So that's part of our history. Let's go down to the next slide there, Freddie. So in this series, you know, I've given you the history, but we're going to talk a little bit about the principles that have carried forward even to today and why our churches operate the way they do. The first thing is we do make a distinction between faith and opinions. 
that great motto that uh, one of Luther's protégés coined in, in matters of faith, unity, and matters of opinion, liberty, and all things charity or love, right? That's a, a strong um, attitude within the, the restoration movement. Another principle we're going to look at is the church is one. It is a unity movement. Now, ironically, um, there was some flaws in how that was carried out. And so the unity they were looking for never really um, flourished beyond the Civil War. The Civil War brought some disunity, obviously, culturally. But also, like we were describing, the distinction between the two movements uh, over instrumental music. And then within the, the a cappella or non-instrumental churches, there's over 20 different divisions within that group. Um, there's, there's a lot of divisiveness when you go down that lane of the tradition. Um, whereas you just had that one division with the uh, Reconstruction 1968 on the, the independent Christian church side. So that focus on unity is key. A third thing is Christian unity is based on the plain teaching of Scripture. Now that's probably where we're going to have a problem. That's where the idealism of enlightenment rationalism, that people could just open the Bible and, oh, obviously that's what it means. We all agree on it. Let's just move on, right? Um, it doesn't always work that way. Um, it takes hard work to study and interpret the Scriptures. Do it in isolation, right? You can't do it all on your own. You need the context of your church. You need the context of the, the historic faith to understand the Word of God. That's why a lot of people who, don't, who are not taught um, take the Bible and they end up with some pretty crazy ideas sometimes. It's because there is a context to understand these things. And, and they might have been a little too idealistic and optimistic in their idea that people could just go by the Bible alone. Now, certainly in terms of authority, that's, that's right. We need to have the Bible as our final authority. But do we need help understanding it? Absolutely, right? Um, and then the fourth thing is that the church is called to evangelize the world. So to illustrate these principles, I'm just going to look at two texts and then we'll be done. Uh, let's look at first at John chapter 17, when Jesus is praying in the garden on behalf of his disciples. In John chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, Jesus says, I am praying not only for these disciples, so not just the, the 11 that are there with him in the garden, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. Now, you couldn't look for a, uh, a pa I couldn't find a passage that would illustrate these restoration principles more than, than John 17, 20, and 21. Because it's a unity movement that's founded on what? The word of the apostles, the message of, of the New Testament, right? That's what they're going to believe through their message, right? Who? The apostles that Jesus is praying for at that moment. Everybody's going to come back. to, And when they do that, they're going to be one. So there's that oneness, that unity. And why do they need to be one? So that the world may believe. There's evangelistic implications for unity. As they saw it, how, why would anybody believe in a church that's so divided? that says this thing here and this thing there. We all need to be one so that the world can believe. And that's exactly what Jesus prayed for, isn't it? Finally, uh, let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Again, along this idea of unity, beginning there in verse 10. Paul says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Some of you are saying, I am a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, for now no one can say they were baptized in my name. Oh yes, I, 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 uh, did, I also baptized the household of Stephanus, 
but I don't remember baptizing anyone else. Verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the good news and not with clever speech for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. So this idea of let's not go by human names. Let's not go by traditions of men. Let's just be Christians only. Are you of Christ? That's enough. Let's be united of the same mind and of the same judgment. Let there be no divisions among you. It was such an optimistic, idealistic uh, movement. And people were drawn to it at the time because they wanted to be part of this new world where here you would have the church finally flourish without those divisions of the old world. And for a time, they actually did it. And it was amazing. And there are many churches today like ours that carry on that tradition, that movement, um, you know, in, in interesting ways, you know. Uh, our church is uh, largely, I say sometimes people say, ask me what kind of church is that? I say, well, it's kind of like a community church because I don't want to give this whole 45-minute talk every time somebody asks me that question. Um, I just say it's a community church. But really, it, it is because of the restoration movement. And some folks have kind of said, well, maybe the restoration movement has served its purpose. There aren't really these hard divisions anymore be, uh, between different church traditions. A lot of people get along whether they are from a different denominational background or not. It's not that significant as it was in the early 1800s. And I think that's fair. But there is something beautiful about this movement of unity founded on the truth of God's word, where we just be focused on following Jesus and being of Christ, being Christians only. Uh, that's, a, that's a beautiful idea, and it's something that keeps us uh, centered, moored in the midst of a world that can be very confusing and often uh, challenging at times. So we're going to continue for a few weeks looking at these restoration principles. Perhaps you're here this morning, though, and you're, you're, you're not a believer. Maybe you, you don't know Jesus. I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus. Um, I think you're going to find that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life as he claimed to be. And, and what these folks in the 1800s were fighting for ultimately was that all would be saved, that they all might believe as Jesus prayed for. So if you're here today and you want to put your faith in Christ, come and talk to me or one of our elders or talk to any of the folks here, and they can share with you about how to know the Lord and to, to find salvation in him. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you and we praise you for all that you are. We ask that you would be with us now as we uh, bring this service to a close. Uh, we pray, Father, that you would uh, watch over us and help us to live out the gospel this week in everything we do. Uh, may we be informed and, and inspired by the, the history of this church um, to carry on that, that gospel preaching and, and worship and uh, Bible-based uh, church life that, that was established in 1846 here in this place and in this community. And uh, may that encourage us to know that uh, even through tough times, uh, the gates of Hades shall not prevail. Uh, the Lord's people can come together and with, with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit at work, there's nothing that can't be accomplished among your people. So we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.